It is my pleasure to welcome to Yang Speaks, a person I admire and have learned a great deal from, one of the most prominent anti-corruption activists in the United States today, the co-founder and CEO of Represent Us, Josh Silver. Josh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Andrew. It's good to be here. Now, again, such a fan of yours. Uh, you've been beating this drum since before it was cool. <laughs> and I'm curious as to how the heck you got so inflamed and passionate about corruption in the government back when we thought still uh, things still worked okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's accurate. Well, you know, it's funny. There was, there was this guy, Randy Keeler, who inspired, inspired Daniel Ellsberg to turn over the Pentagon Papers when he was uh, when Randy was a 19-year-old talking about his opposition to the Vietnam War uh, at Yale. And uh, he inspired Ellsberg to, to spill the beans. And Randy told me in the 1990s, he said, and this is going to date me, is that, you know, he's like, it's all about money and politics and our broken democracy. And if, if until you fix that, you can't fix anything. It doesn't matter if it's environment, climate, healthcare, poverty, whatever issue, education, it, it's all stuck or moving backwards or just subpar because this, the incentives are so broken because bribery has been legalized in America. That was in the 90s. It's gotten a lot worse with Citizens United. But what's clear is you've got this two-headed monster that is uh, American structural political failure that thankfully you're writing about in your new book and that's exciting. Uh, but that's you've got the media which is failing, particularly with the increase in digital media, the, uh, the sort of information bubbles, Wait, the, wait, 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 Josh. The the media is failing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. The confirmation bias, the manipulation of the digital platforms, the failure of the major platforms like Facebook, Twitter to actually put, push push back effectively and quickly. Uh, the failure of legislators to regulate those entities as effectively as we're starting to see in the European Union. And then on the flip side of that, you've got the the second head of the monster, which is the failure of our democratic systems elections, ethics, campaign finance laws that have been manipulated, eviscerated to actually incentivize extremism, to incentivize a lack of competition and incentivize a lack of integrity. And so once you have that light bulb moment that the structures themselves, the information environment and the democratic system itself are skewed towards negative outcomes, then you realize my God, why would I work on anything else? Because until we fix this, we can't fix anything. You are right. Uh, again, you came to this before me and a lot of other folks. So back in the 90s, again, to date you a little bit, that may, that puts you somewhere in your early 30s. So draw us a scene. <laughs> like, What the heck were you up to in your early 30s? Because the fact that you started this very, very significant organization, Represent Us, and anyone listening to this or watching this, if you don't, know it represent us, check it out. Uh, it's an incredible uh, organization that is trying to improve our governance in various ways. It's nonpartisan. It gets people of every political stripe. Uh, but uh, how did you become the sort of person who could start such a significant org uh, starting back in the 30s? And this wasn't the first org you started. I think you started another org. Uh, around yeah. India. <laughs> So also, I'm a little younger than you're making me out to be, Andrew. I was in my late 20s back then in the 90s. But um, I, there, were, at the time, there had been a couple of successful major campaign finance reform laws passed at the ballot, um, most notably in, in the state of Maine. Another one passed in Massachusetts but was not enacted. Um, there was some momentum on campaign finance reform via ballot initiatives. I drove my Chevy Nova out to Arizona in 1997 and became the campaign manager of a successful ballot initiative to create publicly funded campaign finance uh, uh, in, in Arizona. That law went on the books for about a dozen years. Um, and then afterwards, we saw some losses in that space. And I evaluated the situation. I, I talked to this guy, Robert McChesney, a professor at the University of Illinois. And, and we determined that there wasn't a lot of opportunity for democracy reform at the time but there was an opportunity to improve the media reform environment. And we started an organization called Free Press that exists today and deals with technology and media policy in the public interest. Again, so far ahead of the curve, because you did this back in you know, the early 2000s. 2002, 2002, oh, wow. yeah. 
a little bit ahead, either ahead of the curve or just old. I'm not sure which, Andrew. And then, and then after Citizens United, it was very, and that was 2000, January 2011, I believe, 2010, excuse me. Um, that was a major shift for the public consciousness. The Supreme Court rules that any institution, uh, unions, corporations can give unlimited money into American politics through these so-called super PACs. And they said, so long as it's independent of the expenditures of the actual candidate campaigns, but that's a gray zone that was never enforced. So it's this exaflood of money into politics. And suddenly the American public was starting to finally truly realize just how toxic and, and dangerous this flood of money into politics actually is. And that's when I had my light bulb moment of, you know, we need to fix democracy now that we have a critical mass of people who understand the problem. And then I realized a couple other things. One is that all of the organizations working in this space were decided, this is about 10 years ago, decidedly progressive, which is fine. But 75% of Americans, even more at the time, but 75% of Americans today do not self-identify as liberal. Further, only 25% of Americans... I, today, you know, yeah, you should probably stop there for a second. Because <laughs> I'm listening to this, I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, three quarters of Americans don't self-identify as uh, liberal. Um, and I guess you'd throw progressive in the same bucket. So a lot of people listening to this are in environments where uh, the concentration is much higher than that. <laughs> where you think... Um, you know, significantly more than one in four uh, friends of a lot of the people listening to this are, are probably self-identified liberals. Um, so back in 2010, you said, wait, there are a lot of non-self-identified uh, liberals that would also care about this issue? Yeah, and there's no organizations are, that are try advocating for fixing American democracy for the 75%. It's about, right now, it's about 35% uh, of Americans self-identify as moderate, 35% as conservative, 25% as as liberal or progressive and then five percent other so there's nobody talking to that 75 percent. that was assumption number that one five percent is the yang gang i'm just kidding yeah yeah <laughs> that is that is actually true and, and, and then and then of course uh you had the situation where you know only 25 percent of americans are democrats 25 percent are republicans and a full 50 percent according to the most recent gallup data are independents so we are we have to talk to them because there's plenty of groups talking to the left. And further, we have to do most of our fighting on this issue in the states, the same way that the suffragettes did it, the marijuana advocates, the marriage equality advocates. It's stuck in Washington. Let's take the fight to the states. And we started just working on passing high impact democracy reform laws at the state and local level over the last 10 years. And that's where what we've been doing to get us to today. Well, it seems like you're the right man for the job, given that back in 97, you actually stewarded a successful ballot initiative in Arizona. I feel like, uh, you know, like you got a taste for it. You're like, wow, we can just make this happen on the ground in the states. Uh, and that's what Represent Us is trying to accomplish in cities and states around the country. Yeah. And there's been over over 130 cities and states have passed either binding laws or non-binding resolutions on democracy reform in the last six years since 2015. But this includes some biggies, like five major anti-gerrymandering laws passed via ballot initiative in 2018 alone. Before that, there were only two states that had ever done that, California in 2008 and, and Arizona in 2010. We've seen, as I mentioned earlier, ranked choice voting and open primaries passed in Alaska last year in the state of Maine twice, um, and a whole slew of other reform victories around the country. And those those campaigns needed, and this is what we do: is we we need they need support, they need in kind professional uh, drafting of the law, helping with political strategy and campaigns, money. Uh, and and making sure that the campaigns that are are the best and have the best chance of being uh, winning and being implemented are those are the ones that rise to the top and happen. So this is a critical part of this democracy reform equation. And what's really important about it for your listeners, Yang Gang is surely somewhat cynical because we are seeing so much of a mess in American politics today. And it feels like opportunities to actually fix the system are scarce. But this is an area where there's actually cause for some optimism. Whether you realize it or not, 
you're likely way more creative than you think. And in a world where we're all sort of geared towards being a little more science than art, I think it's important to bring out your creative side, which is why we chose to have Skillshare as one of our sponsors on this podcast because they help you bring out your creative side. So you can take a class to learn to be more creative in a whole bunch of different areas. Right now, this is ridiculous, but it's pretty cool. I'm taking a class on indoor gardening and how to grow house plants because frankly, my New York City apartment could use a little more energy. Yeah, that's probably a good way to put it. Anyway, you can take classes on how to edit YouTube videos or how to do portrait photography or how to do video on Instagram. There's a ton of different things, whether it's a hobby or a side hustle or just a way you want to learn to do more things. Skillshare is pretty freaking awesome. And it's incredibly affordable, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes or workshops. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. So right now, I want you to explore your creativity with Skillshare.com slash Yang. So go to Skillshare.com slash Yang and get one month free trial of a premium membership. That's one month of a premium membership at Skillshare.com slash Yang. Become a little more creative, better yourself, Skillshare.com slash Yang. Uh, I, I do want to retrace back to your personal history uh, because a lot of people listening to this are, how, are probably thinking, how the heck does someone become someone like Josh who winds up doing this for a living, uh, starting a, a successful org? So you grew up on the East Coast, right? Uh, did you grow up around political activists? I think your, your mom was like a writer or poet. Is that correct? Yeah, she's a poet and she was, she was an activist. Uh, and I had people like that guy, Randy Keeler, who I mentioned, who was my neighbor who inspired Dan Ellsberg. So there was definitely a bastion of activists where I grew up. They tended to be progressive. Um, but yeah, that was an inspiration. Another part of my story that you might've heard is, you know, when I was 26, so before Arizona, um, I was in South America on this epic adventure and we were, uh, me and a buddy were ambushed and he was shot and killed and I was sort of shot and left for dead. And that was a very transformative period in my life where I sort of realized that life is short, that I have a little bit of time to do big things on this earth and that I should make the most of my time and energy. And I think one of the biggest takeaways, and I'm sure one of the inspirations for your new book is realizing like, let's take on these issues using the most leverage we possibly can. And when you realize that structural reform, political reform is the way to do that, there's no going back. You do have this kind of mildly superhuman energy and aura to you that I, I think a near-death experience might have given you in your mid I mean, I, I, I've read the story. And if anyone uh, wants to read the story, it, it's uh, horrifying. And it seems like a movie... Uh, come to life or, or like a, a TV episode. Um, but Josh's friend was killed and, and Josh was left for dead. And then Josh made it out. Uh, and then he came back and his, he's been this world changing activist since. Uh, certainly, this is not an experience that anyone can replicate. I was hoping you might do something that <laughs> it's like, oh, here's some of the, the things that I, uh, you know, uh, pursued to develop. But you came back, you ran this ballot initiative, you started this org. Uh, and one of the things I love about you is that you you have a very firm read of the problem, but you're very, very solutions oriented. You're very, very practical. Uh, and that's something that distinguishes your org because your org is all about the nuts and bolts. Um, now, Represent Us has a very, very high bar, though you've enlisted some of the most prominent storytellers in the world to help with this, which is trying to get people excited about the plumbing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's a lot easier for me to excite you about the uh, issue of the day, the, the political back and forth, but it's harder to get someone excited about the mechanics. And this is a challenge that I personally am going to be uh, experiencing myself <laughs> over the next number of uh, weeks and months um, with my new book, because I agree with you that without structural reform, we're stuck. Uh, and so you've spent now uh, almost a decade, maybe more now, um, trying to get people excited about the plumbing. Uh, what are the lessons you learned? And when I talk about the high level storytellers, it's people like Jennifer Lawrence and Adam McKay and like these Hollywood types that you've 
uh, persuaded of the truth of the matter, which is that structural reform is where to start. Yeah, well, first of all, you know, one of the challenges, it, 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 it is true. I mean, you're the first person to ever say the plumbing, actually, Andrew, but it's funny because, yeah, I like it. You invite somebody over to your house and you're saying, uh, you know, rather than look at the beautiful flowers and this, this incredible $5,000 new couch um, and this widescreen TV, I want to tell you about why the, the, the pipes in my wall and the electric cables are so important. It, it is a little akin to that. But as you can tell, just by the nature of this interview, that your listeners have spent now less than 15 minutes, but you do need about five minutes to hear the story and understand how this works, right? Like to understand like, wait a minute, how is it that gerrymandering is actually more of an extremism problem than a competition problem, right? Because we all think of gerrymandering. It's like, oh yeah, that's when partisan politicians prevent competition and keep it a, a monopoly in their district. But actually what it really does is push all the, the competition for Congress, congressional races out of the general election and to the primary election where only about 17% of the voters on average participate in their highly extreme partisan voters. And you create a structural incentive to be extreme for politicians because the only competitive threat to them is when they're getting so-called primary from the extremes of their party in the primary. So, you know, once you ex have the moment to explain that and people say, oh, my God, that's Too why we, no, I'm kidding. Right? That's why we can't get ba basic background checks on guns. It's like gerrymandering as much as anything. Uh, once you have that aha moment, that's the aha moment. Jennifer Lawrence, Orlando Bloom, Katy Perry, Adam McKay, Ed Helms and the long list of other celebrities, Michael Douglas, that, that work with us, they've had that and it's starting to domino, right? And I think your new book is gonna be helpful in continuing to, to speed up that domino effect. Because in many ways, I do think that the future of our, of our country, our democracy hinges on how quickly we're able to wake up both the masses and the influential classes to this problem and yes. set about actually fixing it. Yeah, I, I agree. And this is going to be my, my new mission. And I do want to unpack what you just said, because it is so important. So 17% uh, of uh, voters participate in the party primary in a, a typical congressional election. And 83% of the races are either going to be very clearly Democratic or clearly Republican. So if you think Alabama, whoever wins the Republic primary is going to win. Uh, it, for the Democrats to be, you know, whoever wins in um, like an urban area in um, let, let's call it Detroit, Michigan, like it's going to be a Democrat. So if the person wins the primary, then they win. Um, and who participates in the primary? Uh, number one, the members of that party. Uh, but number two, the most activated members of that party, about 17 percent. And there's a very famous quote by a guy named uh, Boss Tweed who's of New York politics. And he said, um, you can do the electing as long as I get to do the nominating. And so the average voter doesn't really have a meaningful choice because by the time it gets to the general, it's predetermined. It's one of the reasons why so many people are so checked out on politics generally. Another number that I cite in, in the book um, is that the overall approval rating for Congress right now is about 20 8%, which is actually a little bit up from what it was. It was more like 17% not that long ago. Like, you know, some people are getting more excited about it, uh, but it's still really low. I mean, 28%, like you wouldn't see that movie. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, but the uh, re-election rate for the average representative is 92%, 94%. Right. Uh, and so if you're that average representative to keep your job, your goal is just to keep yourself from getting primaried and challenged by someone who's going to appeal to the most extreme 17% of voters in your district. Right. And then if you're presented with a situation that might require compromise with the other party, you're going to avoid it because you're like, well, if I do this, the uh, extreme 17% are going to be really mad at me. They're going to uh, have someone challenge me as being impure ideologically. Uh, so I'd rather do nothing rather than compromise because then I can't be attacked uh, mm -hmm. if, if I just hew to the party line. And the most prominent example of this that's going on right now is Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, who actually flouted Trump and said, hey, no, I, I think that uh, 
the insurrection is a problem and, you know, Trump didn't win some other things that are heresy among Republican primary voters, her approval rating among Republican Alaskans right now is something like 15%, so <laughs> like very, very low. Um, but she can still win because Alaska recently adopted open primaries. And so she can make her case directly to all voters instead of just the Republican 17%. Exactly. And we're starting to see it in real time. She's the only Republican co-sponsor of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Real talk, how is your mental health? If it's like mine, probably not that great. I'm losing my mind post-COVID, getting a little better. And the reason I'm getting better is because of our sponsor, BetterHelp, which is amazing, secure, and well, frankly, fairly priced counseling done securely online. So you can start communication and get paired with a licensed professional on a safe, private online environment that's super convenient within 48 hours. It's not a crisis line, it's not self-help, it's professional counseling done securely online. You can talk to your counselor at any time, you get timely and thoughtful responses. I love my counselor, it's freaking awesome, and you can get advice on depression or anger or stress or family conflicts, whatever you're going through. BetterHelp is freaking awesome and it's confidential, convenient, professional, affordable, all the things you need done conveniently online. So I want you to start living a happier life today. And as a listener, you're going to get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor, betterhelp.com slash yang. So join over 1 million people who take in charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash yang. I'm I'm going to do something out of a little out of character. I want to turn the interview to you for a second. You'll probably want to turn the same question back to me. But, you know, there's been this major shift in American politics over the last few years where a, a majority of the Republican, I, I say this as a truly nonpartisan organization and, a, and an independent myself as a voter, a, a majority of the Republican Party has gone kind of full almost like Russian style autocratic, where they want to just sort of rig the rules in their favor blatantly and prevent competition and prevent participation from voters who they think are not going to vote for them. It has changed the calculus strategically for much of, of us, what us uh, political reformers do. What do you, how, how, how profound do you think that impact is, Andrew? Well, it, it certainly makes it harder to try and uh, present bipartisanship as the answer or be even handed if one side seems like they're trying to rig the rules right and left. Um, right. The, the, the thing that I'm uh, mindful of is that uh, if you have an independent actor like Lisa Murkowski, who last I checked is still a Republican, um, that, that it just goes back again to the incentives problem. It's like you have people who are trying to rig it because they think that's going to be good for them and their self-interest, uh, that we have to uh, try and change the incentives uh, for the people involved and, and line it up with um, more of the American public. Because I think the people that are doing the rigging that you're describing tend to be hyper-partisan. Um, yeah. and, and, the, and they may control the party in certain places, um, but I don't think they represent, you know, a majority of voters in any area they might they might represent a majority of hyper partisans in an area <laughs> so so to, so to me uh this makes your work uh i'm going to call it our work because i'm going to be joining you in this um all the more vital like we need to hurry it up so you've been running an organization now doing great work for like a decade um uh, and then there's a, a feeling that the ground is uh shifting underneath our feet like yeah. you're, that, that things are not going well, really. Like it, we're, we're not winning. <laughs> it seems like the democratic institutions are disintegrating in real time. And we're looking around being like, wow, voter suppression laws. Like, you know, that's not very, <laughs> that, that's not very uh, patriotic of you or, you know, the, or principled of you. Um, and so it requires us to think bigger about what kind of changes we need to be fighting for, I think. Um, would you agree? I do. And I think there are some changes long term that we need to look at much more seriously, like like multi-member districts, uh, which is another policy that would have 
a profound impact. For example, it would actually end the gerrymandering debate immediately if you had multi-member districts because it's a completely different way. So, uh, for example, just so people who don't know what it is, in my state of Massachusetts, we have nine members of Congress from Massachusetts. They're actually all they're all Democrats. There is quite a bit of gerrymandering in my state. Um, in, in a in a multi-member district setup, you would probably split the state of Massachusetts in half, and you'd have two districts. One with that would send two mega districts. One mega district would send four members of Congress to Washington, and the other mega district would send five. And then in the election, um, all of the all of the the primary election, all of the um, candidates are, uh, or excuse me, the general, they're all on the same docket. And uh, you just simply pick the one that you want the most out of all these many candidates for Congress. And then the top four or five vote getters out of that entire pool, they all go. So what you end up having is you have a decidedly conservative member go. You have a decidedly uh, liberal one. You probably have a Latino candidate, uh, candidate who goes, a black candidate who goes, what have you. But it's like a it's a superior system and it gets us closer to the, the, the benefits of a parliamentary system in a federalist uh, environment. Now, so is this the case that the uh, Fair Representation Act is making, which is uh, an act that, that I believe has some sponsors now in Congress? Yeah, no chance of passing anytime soon, but it's the right idea. And when we've seen this, this the proposal introduced via ballot initiative in select cities around the country, it has almost won several times. So it's actually something that's got a shot. It's just complicated and technocratic. Now, if we could back the lens out a little bit for a moment. Um, well, well, I just want, I just want to, 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 uh, to talk about the Fair Rep Act a little bit more, Josh. Sure, go ahead. Um, so if I'm one of the nine members of Congress of Massachusetts, does this not essentially eliminate my job? Oh, currently? You yes. would, I mean, if you're one of the members uh, today, you're actually in a pretty good position because you have name recognition. And so, so you're, you're, you could you could win in the mega free for all. Yeah, I guess that's nothing, true. -ish. Nothing to preclude you from doing it. The, but the, the, the opponents of this policy, just like with ranked choice voting, are the two major political parties, right? Because they currently enjoy a duopoly. You of all people know that more than anybody. And so multi-member districts like ranked choice voting are a direct threat to it. Ranked choice voting is literally preferred by everyone in this country, virtually, other than the most rabid partisans. In the same, and you could say the same thing for gerrymandering, same thing for multi-member district. The things that would actually really fix things are despised by the partisan supporters of the Republican and Democratic parties. Now, and again, uh, it, it's one reason I'm so excited about your work is that there almost needs to be a party for nonpartisans, <laughs> which is, I think, sort of what represent us um, is the the beginning of. Um, I, I and I love the fact that you got these high level celebrities to lend their energies to it um, because it, it's such like a principled populist case that everyone should be able to get behind um, and. Uh, you know, and, and a, a lot of politicians, I think, are or sorry, a lot of celebrities are somewhat reluctant to touch politics. Um, so, it, you know, it's a tremendous sign. Plus, they all have buddies. All the celebrities know each other. Well, it's awesome. <laughs> Andrew, it's practical. I mean, you know, Jennifer Lawrence, for example, she is from Kentucky and she's from a really conservative Republican family. And part of the reason she got behind this is she was like, you know what? I was tired of the us versus them. And I wanted to get behind an issue where I can say, you know, this really truly isn't about whether you're a Democrat or Republican or liberal or conservative. This is an American issue. And everybody should be, if they're not, supporting these structural reforms because there's nothing partisan about it. This is just simply about representation, democratic representation, which is at the DNA level of our of our of our constitution. Now, certainly the constitution was drafted imperfectly, but it's made a lot of improvements, including the Voting Rights Act in 1964. And, you know, this is just part and parcel of the legacy of American democracy that's 244 years old, and it's the longest running democracy in the world. So, you know, that that's no small thing. At the same time, 
We're it's showing not, our age, though, unfortunately, Josh. <laughs> I, it is. And it's also not considered a full democracy anymore. I don't know if you've probably seen, starting about four years ago, international rankings by The Economist magazine oh, took, no. <laughs> took the United States out of the category of a full democracy. And it's there's only about 18 of those left in the entire world. And we are now considered a partial democracy because our democratic institutions are so beaten down and broken. Wow. Did they throw us in the oligarchy category? <laughs> it's terrifying. No, we're, we're like down there with like Turkey. I mean, it's, I don't think we're that low, but it's, it's bad. It's, it's, it's really bad. And it's because, uh, I, you know, it's not, and it's not just Trump, right? It's de- like Trump definitely notched us even lower, but this happened, um, you know, before Trump and, and it's, it's been just getting worse. Now, if I can pull out the lens, the lens back a little bit for your listeners, I think it's important to note, like, you know, in the in the fight to reclaim the soul of American democracy, I would argue there's sort of three major fronts that need to occur simultaneously. One is, you know, we need to continue to build this movement. And if you go to represent.us, you can see this can sign up and be part of this. But like we need millions and millions of people who understand, have the light bulb moment, understand. I'm going to try and get us the millions, John. Yeah. And the book's going to help. Book's going to help. And then number two. You need to keep doing what the suffragettes and marijuana advocates and marriage equality people did, which is just keep passing laws at the city and state level opportunistically, where you just pass laws that could change things that are right for that area. And you're not too dogmatic about it has to be ranked choice voting. It has to be anti-gerrymandering. Just pass good laws wherever and whenever you can. And we have to keep doing that. And then the third area is particularly more important now is you have to stop bad things from happening. Like these 30 uh, voter suppression bills that have passed in 18 states in the last seven months, this is a big problem. And we have to continue to beat back against voter suppression. We have to beat back the massive gerrymanderings that are actually, you know, the census data went to the states in August of this year. And now the states are setting about gerrymandering in a more extreme fashion than they have ever, because it happens every two years. It's happening this year. The supercomputing powers are better than ever, and especially states like North Carolina, Florida, Texas. It's out of hand. I mean, the Democrats could have some really, really weird shaped voting districts. They're they're going to be like they're going to like follow like particular neighborhoods around. It's going to be totally bizarre. Big data fueled gerrymandering. 2021. Well, stop that, Andrew. Like there's ways to at least mitigate it. You can't stop it. But gerrymandering is deeply unpopular and you can name and shame these legislators and public officials and at least beat them back to some degree. So you got to play defense on these voter suppression, gerrymandering and other attacks on democracy while you're doing the good proactive long term work. Are you staring at your screen too long? Probably. Is it ruining your eyes? Probably. That's why we recommend Felix Gray blue light glasses. They're the blue light glasses that started it all. Five years ago, they realized our eyes were not meant to look at screens all day and they designed glasses that look really cool and make daily screen time more comfortable and the workday more productive. They filter 15x more of the most important blue light to help your eyes and frankly, they look really cool. You can go online, do the augmented reality thing on their website and see what you look like before you buy these things. I got the Jemison Whiskey Tortoise glasses. Um, I need to bring them on the podcast. Maybe I'll do an episode while wearing them. They're pretty freaking awesome. So check them out. And you can go to felixgrayglasses.com slash yang. Check these out. Put on a pair of augmented reality Felix Gray glasses. See how you look in them. And with summer in full swing, you want those times that you have to plug in to not crush your eyes. If you're going to let anything crush your eyes, it better be sunlight and not screen light, let's put it that way. So now, non-prescription and prescription glasses are available. Check them out now at felixgrayglasses.com slash yang. That's felixgray, F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y, glasses.com slash yang. You get free shipping, free returns, free exchanges. felixgrayglasses.com slash yang. Are there local 
initiatives that you can call out for people that happen to reside in those areas that uh, you're excited about right now? Yeah, so there are some exciting things underway. Uh, Utah may be moving forward um, with a with an open primary rank choice voting. It's possible, not we don't know yet. Missouri is looking closely. Arkansas, Oklahoma, um, there's uh, Massachusetts might revisit this. They tried last year. And- yeah, let's talk about this for a second, Josh. So the states yeah. you just named, as well as Maine and Alaska, uh, are red states. Um, and yet most people associate ranked choice voting with progressives. And yeah. Massachusetts was one of the only states that actually had it on the ballot th- this past November, and it lost. Uh, what's up with that? <laughs> it's a kind of a wonky answer, Andrew. So the, the real answer is that there's this what's called ballot language. And so if you're in a state, about tw- half, roughly half the states have ballot initiatives, half don't. Ballot initiatives are increasingly under attack and difficult to pass. But when you go to vote yes or no on a ballot initiative, you read what's called the ballot language. And it says, do you want to vote yes or no to a law that would do blank? And the problem with with ranked choice voting is that a technocrat in the attorney general's office writes that. And that's not a bad thing. It's just reality. And they tend to write literally what the law does. And in the case of ranked choice voting, it's like, you're just a regular Joe. You just dropped your kid off at soccer. You're late. You're tired. You haven't had dinner. And it's like, this law shall make it so that I can rank my candidates in a sequence of three places. And if one person doesn't get more than 50% of the vote, then your last place vote will instantly be applied. And people just gloss over and are like, I don't know, I'm confused. This makes no sense. No. And that's a fundamental challenge, which, and it's the reason why Massachusetts lost. And it would have required a 20 or $30 million persuasion campaign. And while 10 or $12 million was spent, which is a lot of money, it wasn't enough to beat that dynamic. Wow. Uh, is there a way to improve that language or is it just the case that the attorney general is going to write it? And is the attorney general just risk averse or is there self-interest where they're like, I kind of don't want this thing to pass. So I'm going to make it confusing. (laughs) Sometimes that's the case. It wasn't the case in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, the, the attorney general here is actually quite friendly towards these kinds of reforms. The problem is, is that the, the short answer is no, you don't have sufficient control over that. Because, you know, it, they, they literally the, the law says that the attorney general's office has to make a description of the law, put it on the ballot and voters decide. And it hot, suddenly becomes very political and tricky if you alter it. So it's just an inherent obstacle. And this is one of the many that we have. And that's why we're not going to see these kinds of reforms pass until we it's truly back to the plumbing, man, it's back to the plumbing. We got to build it. And, and it's also back to your book. It's like building a giant number of people who are keenly aware of this and like, you know, getting 20% of Americans to actually know what's going on here, which is a lot, but it's doable. And it would be a game changer because if we did, if we could get one out of five Americans to have the light bulb moment, hopefully you're having right now listening to this podcast, well, then we can actually win these things. Yeah, amen. So if Massachusetts got it on the ballot in November of last year, does that mean it's going to be on the ballot again in 22? No, it means it's dead and there's going to have to be a whole new signature drive, a whole new effort. Um, so there's a lot of work to do. The other, but the, so I, and I don't, whether that happens or not is anybody's guess. There's also an increased use of legislative lobbying. Like, so for example, a quiet, important victory. This year, the Vermont state legislature passed what we call Colorado style vote by mail, which is a 100 percent vote by mail system. Every voter gets a ballot and uh, it comes with postage and it goes to a, a system where three out of the five highest voter participation states in the 2020 election were Washington, Oregon and Colorado that all have 100 percent vote by mail systems. It's contrary to what former President Trump says. It's secure, it's reliable, it's proven, it's convenient. And if we had that everywhere, it would be a complete game changer. It just passed in the state of Vermont. So we're going to see more efforts like that in other states around the country via legislative lobbying. So as I said before, we just have to keep chipping away at it. So we we referenced earlier how um, both you and I are gravely concerned about uh, the ongoing erosion slash disintegration of our uh, 
democratic institutions and infrastructure, a lot of Americans are in um, a lot of doubt. Uh, you talked about how a lot of people listening to this are probably quite cynical. Um, there was a lot of blaming of Trump for the last number of years. And now that Trump's uh, out of the White House, now I think people are trying to figure out who or what to blame. <laughs> I, 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 feel like, uh, I feel like you've been making the right case uh, over this last period. Um, I, people are concerned, though, and it feels like some of these local victories, even if we get them, um, may not be like uh, an antidote uh, to some of the things that, that ail us. Um, how has your thinking shifted, if at all, over the last number of years? And again, one thing I love about you is that um, you're a true clear-eyed problem solver, where you look at it. I mean, for me, in my case, I ran an entrepreneurship nonprofit that I'd started uh, and ran it for six years and realized that the changes I needed to make if I was actually going to solve the problem were like much bigger than uh, what my nonprofit was going to be able to actually deliver in a particular period of time. And then that's what drove me to do something very rash, which was run for president of the United States. And at the time, no one thought that was a good idea. <laughs> and, um, but it was born of the fact that I'd been deeply invested in work trying to create opportunities for Americans for uh, years prior um, in your case, you're now, you know, again, the chief anti-corruption, pro-democracy activist, maybe in our society. You're, you've seen it all. You've seen the wins. You've seen the losses. Um, and it, it does seem like, unfortunately, we're backsliding in various ways. If I were to give you a magic wand, like what would you do with it that might be? So number one, it sounds like is somehow get 20 percent of Americans to think the way you and I do. And I'm going to do my best to try and increase that percentage. I don't know what it is right now. Maybe uh, let me start there for, for you. Like what percentage of Americans do you think get how uh, deeply problematic our uh, structures are and want to change them? Between three and 5%. All right. And that's because of you. If not for you, it'd be, you know. Well, like, no, it's roughly the same amount you've been getting in uh, as, a, as a vote tally in your run. <laughs> I mean, that's actually, you know, it's the Yang gang. It is the Yang gang. It's true. Yang yang. Yang. Uh, you know, I, I saw a poll just for your edification too, Josh. That was, um, it, it was uh, like my level of support. And it was in that range, let's call it, I think it was like, uh, you know, somewhere like five to uh, 7% among Democrats. Yeah. And then it rose to maybe twice that level among like the general public. <laughs> So there was, there was something, one, one of the things I did realize over time is that I'm kind of a funny fit for uh, the Democratic primary electorate, um, in part because I think the Democratic electorate is more uh, invested in and also more uh, likely to believe in institutions. Uh, like one of the numbers that uh, I, uh, I found very telling is that 69% of Democrats believe in media, that the media is telling the truth most all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, that number among Republicans is something like 19%. And then among independents, like folks like you, um, it's like 38%. Mm -hmm. So the so Democrats like believe in the in in what the media is saying, they believe in institutions, they believe in the machine. And then a guy like Andrew Yang comes along, and then like I'm not, I'm clearly not of the <laughs> institutions or establishment. So there's like some natural resistance, and then that resistance actually disappears when I wind up talking to uh, independents or Republicans to a significant measure. Yeah, I mean, for sure, it's an it's an issue. But but you know, you preface that apt comment by by asking like if you could wave a magic wand. I, I think, and in, in, in the parallel between your frustration after six years of running a nonprofit and running for president, I think the analog here today is I do think that we, the public interest community, we need to start sharpening our knives um, metaphorically, and but 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 hitting the bad guys a lot harder, like a lot harder, and creating much more political pain. And when I say bad guys, I'm talking about the tech platforms. I'm talking about the Facebooks and the Twitters and the and the major purveyors of, of digital. I mean, you know, the misinformation, the latest one around the pandemic and COVID and vaccines, which they're finding despite 
I'm air quoting here if you don't see me, best efforts by Mark Zuckerberg and company to curate content and, and content and ensure factual accuracy. There's just gobs of disinformation flooding Facebook and other platforms. We have to beat those digital platforms back much harder. Um, we have to beat back the autocrats. And they do happen to be Republicans, but it is not about Democrats, Republicans. It's not partisan. But these folks who are trying to, you know, decertify election results and suppress votes, this is deeply un-American behavior. It's it's what you'd expect to find in, in Vladimir Putin's Russia. And we need to go after these guys ruthlessly, relentlessly in an electoral sense and and get and make sure they get unelected. So do it smartly. Go for the ones that actually are not so gerrymandered that they're untouchable. But we have to start creating real electoral pain in a very focused way on the biggest threats to American democracy. Well, I certainly agree with you on the tech platform front. Uh, media has problems. Uh, social media has bigger problems <laughs> where, where social media uh, ends up rewarding the most inflammatory uh, content. I think there was one study that showed that fake news spreads more uh, powerfully uh, than real news six to one on social media. And so if you're trying to make a name for yourself, the more sensationalist your statement, uh, the more likely you are to grow. Um, uh, and I think that's making it so that meaningful reform becomes next to impossible because people can't agree on even the basics. Uh, there's something, uh, did you read um, Ezra Klein's book, Why We're Polarized? It came out, I think maybe a year and a half ago. I did. Yeah, so uh, the argument he makes that I think is really powerful, uh, and it's something that I took to heart, um, was that at this point, politics has become tribal in American life. Uh, and I discovered a new tribe through my presidential campaign. Thank you, Yang Yang, love you. Um, but like the, the language I was using uh, was just the language of facts and figures around economics and automation. Uh, and it was wild, Josh, because people did not know what to do with it. Like, like people in the political world were like, this stuff, uh, you know, is so foreign to me, like talking about the loss of 4 million manufacturing jobs or 40,000 manufacturing jobs in Iowa or, or, or the death of retail. Like these were not things that ever came up. And, and I think that if you take Ezra's uh learnings seriously, which I did. One thing he said that really hit home and people should reflect on what this means is that the correlation between your political viewpoint and your policy viewpoints is uh, very low. <laughs> that, uh, that because I say I'm, I'm conservative and then if I actually list out a bunch of conservative policies, like my correlation with those policies is actually going to be kind of low. Like I'm probably going to be pissed off at high drug prices too. I'm probably going to be pissed off like a, at a bunch of stuff. Um, the, the correlation on a statistical level is only 0.25. Um, it would be one if it was a perfect. And the thing is, we all imagine that it's close to one that, you know, but, but the truth is Americans function in teams at this point and not in white papers. Um, so I discovered a new tribe, uh, through my presidential campaign that responded to uh, economics and technology talk and automation. Um, and like that, that's really what the task ahead of us is in my view, Josh, is to build this new tribe around a tribe of facts and truth and anti-corruption and strengthening democracy. Um, social media does make that harder because now even facts are, um, you know, increasingly disputed, which is a very dark thing. Um, and uh, I do think that you're going to need the tech platforms to be at the table if you're going to truly fix this. And our government, not atypically now, unfortunately, is like way, way, way behind the curve on those issues. Um, I'm a big fan of Tim Wu, who is part of this administration, uh, who is very sophisticated in his thinking. Um, the average member of Congress, I think, is barking up the wrong tree. Um, if you looked at the tech hearings, like they, they were arguing about issues that I thought missed the mark um, very significantly. And so just throwing in my echoing uh, the fact that if you were talking about the tech platforms, you're right. Yeah, but a couple of things. One, Tim Wu was the chair of the board of my previous nonprofit. So I'm, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. But um, one thing that gives me a little bit of 
of of optimism. And I'm not trying to be sort of you know saccharine optimistic for your listeners. I actually believe there's a lot of bright spots. Another one is if you look at that rapidly expanding percentage of independent voters that Gallup identifies, we talked about it earlier. Building the new tribe, Josh. We got to give them a flag. Yeah. And, and you know, a lot of people listening will say, yeah, I get it. They're 50%. But of the 50% who identify as independents, most of them, and this is true, reliably vote with one major one or the other. Yeah. But the fact that they're independents is a real opportunity for us because that's just massive fertile ground. Not only is that 50% much more predisposed to joining this new tribe of ours, that's also fact-based, by the way, you didn't mention that, but also there are high percentages of self-identified Republicans and Democrats who are deeply unsatisfied with their party. So, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is fertile ground. And that is, that is how this can all happen and start to domino the way we need it to. And we only need 11 million Americans to join the tribe. There was a study that looked at successful political moment, uh, movements historically in every country around the world over the last 100 years, an extensive study that showed that every movement that had uh, mobilized at least, I think it was 3% of the population. I, I need to relook it up. In, in our case, it would work out to about 11 million Americans. They were all successful. It was the unifying trait. Well, that's great. 11 million sounds very doable. That's going to be my new target number. Uh, okay. I live on goals, Josh, as I know you do too. It's the only way you've gotten so much done. Yeah. Uh, if, if someone wants to support your work or keep up with you, uh, is represent.us the best place for them to go? It is. Join us. Um, we, we You have a home with Represent Us. We are nonpartisan. We're about real solutions. We're about reclaiming democracy, getting every issue un, unstuck. And we can't do it without 11 million people. So by all means, join. Represent Us is the truth. Josh Silver is a class act. Uh, and I can't wait to work with you to build this tribe. Thank you so much, Josh. And again, right. man, I learned so much from you. Uh, you. You've been fighting the good fight for years and years now, and we're gonna get you a lot of company. Likewise, thank you, Andrew. Good being on. <laughs>